Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's session, the morning session on digital health governance and what models and frameworks are needed for long-term success. Uh, my name is Dimitra Pantelli. It's a pleasure and an honor to be your moderator for this session. We have wonderful speakers to discuss this issue that we're all aware of, or increasingly aware of, uh, of digital health technologies coming into our uh, healthcare system with big promises uh, and with a lot of potential to really revolutionize the way that we deliver health services, um, and the concurrent uh, need to ensure that we use them in the best possible way to add value for patients, to ensure both individual and societal well-being. Uh, so we have brought a number of perspectives here today to discuss exactly this issue of how we balance these different uh, perspectives to ensure um, that we achieve this goal. I will uh, not uh, present the topic any longer because we have uh, Christina Engel who will do this for us. Um, Christina is the deputy chief uh, of the section on health systems and quality um, at the Austrian Health Fund. Um, and Christina, you will give us a short introduction, and then I will introduce our panel who will bring the different perspectives from their own um, institutions. So I will ask you if you can, thank you. Uh, while you're going up, uh, I will let everyone know that we are using Slido for polls and word clouds during the session. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Um, we will take uh, points from the floor uh, if we manage this. Uh, and just very briefly to say thank you uh, for making this to this early morning session today, despite the party last night uh, and despite the long week that we have behind us. Christina, over to you. Thank you, Dimi. Dear ladies and gentlemen, a sunny good morning on this last day of the European Health Forum Gasta in 2023. Quite a few of us made a deep dive in blue at yesterday's dinner party. A respectful thanks to you for joining us in this morning session. While taking a shower this morning, an old Beatles classic tune captured my mind. It's been a hard day's night and I've been working like a dog. I hope um, right now we don't feel the other way around. It's a hard night's day. So, okay, let's dive into our topic, governance models for digital health. Perhaps you are dreaming of personal AI assistance, booking doctor appointments, or ordering a self-driving car to get you there. Or maybe you are dreaming of getting all you need services 24 hours a day right into your living room. Reality is quickly catching these dreams. Maybe some of you attended the networking session on international digital health on AI on Wednesday and agree that over the last two decades, artificial intelligence has become a vital sector of innovation with great potential to improve health and well-being of individuals and communities worldwide. But hold on, are we ready to use these new technologies safely, or do we need to slow down a little? It's not the usual subjects, the bureaucrats or the governments that ask these questions. No. You remember the open letter in March 2023 where the tech leaders like Musk, like Wozniak and others called on all AI labs to immediately the further development of AI systems. Who in this room believes in the possibility of slowing down the pace of progress. So slowing down <laughs> the development is wishful thinking. We better forget that and start with our duties to get organized right now. The new technologies require strong regulatory mechanisms that balance the speedy developments of disruptive technologies with the need of safety for patients and healthcare workers. I'm not here to describe the status of health telematic infrastructure in Austria and the use cases like our IMR that is freely available for patients or our electronic prescribing system. Today's discussion is about identifying what criteria needs to be taken into account when designing 
governance frameworks to allow a smooth integration of digital innovation. It is about finding ways, minimizing the risks, and involving academic industry system partners so that the framework we create meets the needs of our society. As one of the biggest European health insurance funds, we host this session to learn from others with advanced knowledge. Special thanks to our panelists, Anna Teufel, Annabel Sebom, Ren Bellesa, and Yanis Natsis, and our well-known, knowing moderator, Dimitra Pantelli. Ladies and gentlemen, with my welcome, I had to replace the presence of our president, Andreas Hus, who is busy in further developing the framework of an Austrian healthcare reform and setting with the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Health, and the representatives of the federal states. Best regards from Andreas. Thanks a lot. Dimi, I think it's your turn. I'm enthusiastic to sit down, open my ears, and my mind. Thank you very much, Christina. for the wonderful introduction and the wonderful singing. I think it brings everyone's mood up. James, uh, first of all, thanks to you, James, helping us on the organization uh, of, the, of the session. Can I ask you to launch the first poll that we had in mind for the session on Slido? For those of you who are in the room, if you can't see it, if you can't scan the QR code, oh, people are answering already. Wonderful, I haven't even announced it yet. Have you ever used an AI symptom checker Yes, no, I don't know whether AI was involved. Yes, 60%, no, 40%, don't know whether AI was involved. There's more people voting. Let's wait a couple of seconds, see what happens. Okay. So we have about half, yes, or about about half or about 60% of people saying they have never used an AI symptom checker before. Can I ask, do we have those people, some of those people in the room with us? And if you answered no, have you ever put symptoms into Google search? Yeah, so that is also AI powered. So that's, everyone has done this, I think, more or less. Or if you haven't, kudos to you. Um, so I think this is one of the classic examples where you may not be aware, but this is the way that this works. So we need to think about that uh, as well, and I think we take this away as a message for the, for the discussion later on. If we go to the second bit of interaction that we had in mind, now we ask you, using your phones or using Slido uh, on your computer, um, to think about innovative technologies in the health sector, and where do you see uh, the most important areas uh, of application and opportunities? Streamline, okay, we have four people who are courageous enough. Let's try for a couple more. Streamlined healthcare, and that probably means reducing the burden both for patients and for professionals. Responsiveness, personalized medicine, so bringing technology closer to the patients, disease testing, which is interesting, and we maybe come back to that in a minute. So I don't know if you have something specific in mind, like for example, Digital melanoma checks, we had that uh, during this conference earlier in the week. Um, but we see, we see the patterns, so supporting health workers, supporting patients, bringing care closer to the patient. Yes, responsiveness and personalized medicine seem to be the, the, big, the big winners, and I think this is also something to take away with us for the panel discussion, that if we're using these technologies to bring health care closer to the patients, we really, and in, in some ways perhaps, um, exchanging healthcare that we would actually deliver a different way uh, with a digital application, then we need to make sure that we have concrete governance frameworks to ensure that we do that uh, in an effective and a respectful way. So I thank you very much for participating. Uh, we'll have a couple of those uh, coming up uh, during the session as well. 
And now Christina briefly introduced our speakers. I will do so as well, and I will invite you all to come up to the stage and take a seat. I'll do this alphabetically, so Ran, heads up. First one is Ran Baliser from Klalit in Israel. You are the Deputy DG and the Chief Innovation Officer. You're also a public health professor. It's a long affiliation, but it's also a number of really cool perspectives to bring to the panel. Thank you, Ran, for being here. Have a seat. Yanni, Yanis Natsis, is the Director of the European Social Insurance Platform will bring us that perspective. Then we have Annabel Sebom, who is the Secretary General of the European Coordination Committee of the Radiological, Electromedical and Healthcare IT Industry. You may think you don't know them, but they are closer, you know them, it's just a very long name. And then we have Anna Teufel, uh, who is a researcher at the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute in Austria for digital health and patient safety. Thank you all very much for joining us. Yanis, after you have opened the water, I will start with you. Um, from the perspective of your institution, um, what is it that you would need to make better, best use of digital health technologies? What types of framework, what types of information, what types of, let's say, a, a foundation to make your decisions about how best to introduce, perhaps, to fund these types of technologies? Yes, good morning. Thank you, uh, Dimi. Um, it's interesting that we started talking already about AI and, and thank you for really putting us into this, um, into this uh, theme and for fostering this very timely discussion, especially as uh, in Brussels where I'm based and uh, for, for EASY where we try to bring uh, the voice uh, uh, and the, the messaging of uh, health insurers uh, and social security institutions overall to EU decision making. We're discussing, for instance, a very important piece of legislation which will have far-reaching implications, for instance, the European Health Data Space Regulation um, a file, uh, which has to do directly with what we're talking about. I mean, we talk about digital health, but it's a very broad um, a theme and the file where I'm very curious to see if we will manage to reach consensus, for instance, in the coming uh, months by the end of this mandate, because it is very um, complex and very technical, uh, but at the same time uh, there is political pressure to uh, conclude these files. So let's see how that goes and that will have also um, huge implications, including for social security institutions. And I think it is um, obvious, but I would like to emphasize that for us as social security institutions, uh, we, we have a, a direct implication and involvement in this, uh, in developing digital health in the broader sense, in, in financing these um, uh, interventions, in co-designing, and obviously uh, our members have uh, lots of um, hands-on experience about how these interventions work or don't work. Mm -hmm. um, so just to, to go back, obviously, to your, um, to, to your question, I think it is important, since this is the very beginning of our conversation this morning, to also remind us that we are doing this. Why are we even talking about this? Because this has to serve um, our health goals, mm -hmm. right? I mean, right. this is the broader uh, framework. We should start from that. It should be, um, when we talk about the digital health, uh, it should be in line with um, the performance that we want to get for our health systems. Um, so I apologize for emphasizing yeah, and perfect. reminding of the, of the basic context, but it is important to um, remember because there is a lot of talk uh, about it. And, and um, from our perspective, especially because we serve millions of insured across Europe, it is important that when developing these um, solutions uh, that obviously make the life uh, easier or have the potential to make the life easier for administration, for healthcare professionals, um, for us, for patients, we need to make sure that also we get it right to ensure the trust mm -hmm. in the system. Um, and that we see, you know, I started, uh, I started off talking directly about the issues that are close to my heart, like the health data space regulation mm -hmm. in Brussels. But there, um, you know, it is, in, it is extremely important to maintain the trust in the system for citizens um, overall, uh, not to mention for uh, uh, patient safety and other uh, implications. So I'll stop here because I touched upon different topics, but I just wanted to also broaden a bit our, our discussion. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much, Jan. So I take from it that the, there is a real need for good data, right? So good data that is related to how these applications or technologies work uh, and what the consequences might be, what the benefit might be, what the consequences might be. And so, Annabel, I come to you with your perspective on this issue, I mean, from the innovator side of things, what is it that you need to be able to balance both the ability to innovate, but also the ability to provide, for example, the, the payers with the information that they need? 
Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you. Um, indeed, I do agree with you, Yanis, of course, with our trust and the buy-in of uh, people to share data, for instance, so that developers actually can innovate. Yeah, without trust, it doesn't work. And for trust, and not only for trust, but also for ensuring patient safety, for having uh, good products, for having um, benefits for patients, of course, we do need strong and good regulatory frameworks. They need to be sound and proportionate, though, and what we currently see, and you manage the European health data space, from a developer's point of view, what we really wish to avoid is having spaghetti legislation, and that's what we currently have. If I may give you a, a short snapshot of what I mean with spaghetti legislation, we do have horizontal pieces of legislation like AI Act, GDPR, Data Act, and vertically we have, as you mentioned, European Health Data Space as a Lex Specialis sort of to the GDPR. We have the medical device regulation, which of course my sector is heavily affected by, and we have the IVD regulation, again our sector is heavily affected by. Now this all creates, in my view, spaghetti leg legislation because we do have conflict. I'm not going into detail here. We do have conflicting obligations and requirements, and thus this does not serve. Um, ultimately nobody, uh, and it may hamper innovation in the end, and it may hamper access to equitable care for patients in the end. So, um, yeah, that's, that's my take on this. Okay, and, and just for the analogy, the spaghetti part is that it's all not aligned and sort of boiled it's up a, together. It's a okay. bowl of <laughs> legislation. All right, <laughs> great. So, and it's difficult to pull the strands together after a certain point, I assume. Okay, good, we take that with us, because I think we discussed during the, the session also about what we can do at the European level. Anna? Uh, we're coming to you, you have your own microphone, uh, and you are on the research side of things. So you look at evaluation of different types of technologies. How important is a sound evidence base uh, for the evaluation of, of digital health technologies? I think it's very important. Actually, it's crucial because if it doesn't work, it won't be used. And it has to work for the patients, for the healthcare professionals, for the system. So you have to evaluate if it works and you have to ask them because if we do something, we have to yeah, evaluate what we're doing, actually. And, I mean, I think it can't be uh, inferior to everything we already have. So we have to see if it's better, if it's working better, if it's, yeah, if, it, if it's, if it's um, a benefit for patients, for healthcare professionals, and you only have, can do it if you evaluate it. And you are already evaluating other types of technologies. We have a tradition of evaluating pharmaceuticals or evaluating medical devices, analog medical devices. Um, do you, how do you think, the, how do you see the role of the, of the patients in this, in this process? So how can they be involved, perhaps with a particular view on digital health technologies where we're thinking about, for example, patient-facing apps that would be replacing perhaps some other type of care? I think qualitative research comes in here very, very, um, very important because, I mean, you, you know clinical trials and you know all, all of this, these things, but I think this is the, this is the time for um, qualitative research and it's including the views of the patients and how it works and how it works for them and if it works for them. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, yeah, you just don't know. It's perhaps also a vehicle to develop the type of trust that Yanis was talking about um, earlier. I take uh, this point uh, also of using the different types of data and go to RAN. RAN, during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in Israel, you were one of the first to mass vaccinate, largely due to digitalization and the willingness to share data. What can we learn from that experience? It connects well to everything that was discussed until now. Uh, we all remember that digitization, innovation, uh, and data is means for an end. It's not an end by itself, and we need to have the prize in clear view in order to drive because change is difficult and the infrastructure creation is difficult and costly and complex and spaghetti legislation and all of the other things that make it difficult. So why should we? So let's take a look at the COVID-19 as an example, what happens when you have all of these things aligned and ready for you. So the first example, and I will go kind of chronologically as, as the pandemic uh, uh, continued, as early as March 2020, we have been able to produce, thanks to our data and our previous experience, a predictive model that allowed us to understand which one of all of our five million patients are at the highest risk of severe COVID once they get infected. And this is March. There were very few cases. Even globally, we took uh, uh, previous flu models and adapted them to the data coming out of Italy and, and China in order to, to make them uh, um, 
relevant to COVID-19. We then identified 200,000 individual patients that were at the highest risk for uh, a severe disease, and we made sure that GPs call each and every one of them. 200,000 calls during March 2020, and I know because we monitored one by one, 99% adherence. So 200,000 calls to these patients, hello, sir, there's this new disease coming, it's called COVID, you might have not heard about it, but it's really coming, and we would like to urge you to stay at home as much as you can, not to go to crowded places, and if you need care, we'll bring it to your home or do an online service, please don't come to the busy clinic and risk having this new disease. So this is example number one, what happens when you have all of the infrastructure ready and aligned. Uh, the second example that I will potentially give is when we had very few tests uh, a month or two later and we really needed to do judicious use of them. We created, again, a predictive approach that took the data of each one of those patients and identified which one had the highest risk of being infected with COVID because there was a lot of COVID in their neighborhood and in their surrounding family and, and, and their personal characteristics were ones that put them at risk. And then the physicians in every GP clinic, when a patient came in with something else, with headache, with a completely uh, uh, other, they had an alert. Come up to the physician says, we know this patient came in for a different reason. Since he is at high risk for contracting COVID, do consider asking if they lost their smell or taste or if they have signs and symptoms and send them to a test. Mm -hmm. So this is an, the second example. And the last example that I give from COVID and the use of innovation and data is when the vaccines came in and we began mass vaccinating everyone as early as February or even January 2021, we already had the first in the world, real world outcomes of vaccine effectiveness that we could share with our decision makers. And being the chair of the COVID-19 advisory team to the government throughout the pandemic, I can tell you this was a critical piece of information for us to take very practical steps in that time to stop our lockdown and to completely open it because we knew the vaccines are working. Had we not known, we couldn't have stopped a month-long lockdown and in, in view of ensuing uh, morbidity in the ICUs. So three examples, three real-world use. So, you know, when you make all of these attempts to digitize and to make the data ready, you need to understand what is the potential. And I think this is an example of what is the potential. Yes. Thank you very much. I think it's very useful also because just through the examples and what we have been discussing so far, you, we see also the broad range of different types of applications that we understand under digital health right? Because and digitalization. Because I think this is important if we talk about governance models, perhaps the ground principles might be the same for some of the things, but if it's a different story if we're talking about, uh, for example, a reimbursement mechanism in a country for patient facing ups, and it's a different story if we're talking about data governance in a big healthcare system. So I think, yes, Yanis, go ahead. Yes, I was just inspired by, by what she said. And I think what we need is, first of all, we need to have um, norms and guidelines so that we know how to navigate our way in this, I will call it the jungle of what's happening uh, oftentimes. So first of all, we need that. And also from our perspective as national uh, statutory social security institutions, it is very important to be able to know how to understand also this, this um, landscape. And, and in that sense, also to help us evaluate the quality of all of these interventions and possible uh, digital solutions, because we cannot just take it at uh, face value. Um, and in that sense, it would also be useful. Another element would be also to have the potential for horizon scanning. I mean, it also sounds a bit familiar with what we see in the field of uh, pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. um, in order to be able to have informed uh, decisions uh, from our side, because obviously, especially in the case of social security institutions, we're massive uh, data uh, holders and data users. and um, and all of that to do it in a super transparent and inclusive uh, way. But these are, in my opinion, key elements mm -hmm. um, that we need in order to be able to navigate ourselves. And obviously, consistency across the different initiatives and complementarity with national infrastructure. Uh, we have here our Austrian member. I mean, we're talking and we're looking at um, having invested already significant amounts of money and, and energy in developing these uh, solutions and systems and, and working with uh, all the different stakeholders and the different links of the chain. Therefore, uh, these are essential elements that we need to take into account. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if, yes, we go. Actually, we are, if I may add to this, uh, Janis, and we are of course prepared to, to support you in this exercise, because just to give you an example, 
to give you an example what we do in terms of improving um, digital governance, um, we have not only company members developing good products, innovative products, safe products, but we have national trade associations as members. Um, and for instance, in Belgium, uh, we have Agoria, who worked together with the insurer to, to see uh, what to do with latest technologies and how to bring them into the system. And they um, came up with a new model, which is called Pyramid. I'm not an expert on this, but you can all read it in our report, which we published recently, um, which is applicable as of the 1st of October, allowing new digital health solutions to get into the market, at least for a certain period, um, with an interim for an interim time, and then to allow for further assessment and for more evidence whether this is a use useful application. The same is going on in France, as well as in other countries, and my members at least, of course, they do support these um, developments and bring also um, ideas and are in touch with the insurers to make sure this is running sound. But we have um, published this summer a report about this where you can look it up, uh, what we're doing in this respect. Thank you. Anna, I don't know if you want to come in on something specific. What I wanted to, to ask you, you are at a department that has digital health and patient safety as two issues that come together. And based on what you've heard so far from the discussion, how would you, where would you see the, the, the risk or the need for more focus on patient safety? I think there's a focus on patient safety if you, if you have to involve patients. I mean, that, that's the WHO. Uh, topic this year, and it's, but it's it's important anyway, not just this year, but also the, the following years. And I think all the things we're discussing here, we should also discuss it with patients on the table, because if they don't know about it, if they don't, if if they are not involved, they can't use it the way they need it. Because I mean, we do need what we need. Uh, we do know what we need, but we don't know what they need. And if we don't ask them, we will never know. And to just implicate that we know everything they, they have in their lives and they're experts for their lives as patients. So we should involve them to, in order to, to get all these perspectives at the earliest possible um, point of time. Because if we don't have that, we might develop something that's not for the patients. And they're the main goal. I mean, without patients, we wouldn't need any, any research in, in this case. So, yeah. So patient involvement is very important. You were mentioning, especially for the types of applications of digital health that patients would be using themselves somehow. But if I link back to what you were saying, Ran, I mean, the, the, the examples that you were bringing were mostly not things that patients had in their control, but mostly the digitalization of the health system as a whole, using patient data to enable your models. So I wonder if you can weigh in a little bit on the, this willingness to share data that, in, that makes that possible as, as far as I, as I can understand. And also how have you have, how have you, you have balanced, what governance mechanisms do you have in order to have that success that you described for us? Thank you. So I think first of all, we have to acknowledge that uh, we have a fortunate backbone uh, to begin with, which makes it a little bit easier to do everything. The first point is that we've had fully digitized data for now 20 years. We've made all of our data fully digital in mid-90s, and we've been analyzing and doing predictive modeling for 15 years now. So we didn't come to this event and trying to reinvent the wheel. We already have established evidence for that. Uh, the second point is that, indeed, uh, some of our innovation is physician and provider facing, and some are patient facing, and we see a lot of um, benefits in both. To give one example of a patient-facing approach, which is let's take, go out of sick care and move to health care, we have a patient-facing app that is aimed to induce uh, physical activity through various behavioral science mechanisms, behavioral economics, and various other approaches. We've had tremendous success uh, in that with uh, uh, more than a million uh, active users and a visible, measurable improvement in physical activity as well as reduction of uh, some chronic disease exacerbation with data already piling up. So what I'm saying is that you can use those mechanisms on both sides. In terms of patient safety, the point that you've mentioned before, I think it's critical. Any one of these interventions can backfire. And we need to remember that. Um, the fact that it's digital doesn't make it safe. The fact that it's uh, advanced and innovative doesn't make it appropriate. Just like pharmaceuticals and just like medical device, any one of these applications, it could be a two-edged sword. 
And therefore, you need to have the same mechanisms that you have for other uh, interventions, and you basically need to make a pre, uh, uh, an assessment, continuous assessment before, during, and after deployment to assess the potential risks as well as the benefits and to properly weigh them, and then to see whether the actual application is achieving what you've planned. I will add one another piece of uh, caution uh, advice uh, on that matter. We know how things work for the pharmaceutical industry and medical device. We know that when we've tested a pharmaceutical or medical device in one country and we've shown it to be safe and effective, we can almost immediately take it and put it in another setting and it should work. The biologics works the same way in the human body, whether you're in Austria or you're in Turkey. That's not the case for digital health and for digital innovations, especially for AI. When you take an AI tool that was developed in country A and you move it to country B, there's an extreme high likelihood and there's a, a, a mounting of, of evidence being piling up right now to show it the transfer of the models from one country to another is not as seamless as it would be for a medical device or for a pharmaceutical. So you have to do something that you don't have to usually do, which is a setting specific assessment of whether what you're doing is appropriate. And that puts a huge burden on regulators and health systems that are completely ill-equipped right now to do this. They don't have the expertise, they don't have the know-how, they are completely in disadvantages, uh, disadvantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, producers and the developers, especially uh, uh, the big tech companies. And so we need to begin uh, uh, addressing this kind of uh, unbalanced uh, uh, situation and take it into account when we introduce new innovative, especially AI-driven applications, there's a new set of regulatory frameworks that we need to put in place and they are a little bit more complex than what we've seen until now. I'll stop there and I'll add later if you'd like. Thank you very much. Everyone is quite eager to come in. I think, Anna, just a second. Anna, you were first. Uh, it, is, it a, is, it a, is it on AI as well or is it going in a slightly different direction? No, it's on AI and yes. the risks that Ran um, mentioned, uh -huh. because I think this is a very important thing and we learned that from our Austrian Patient Council because we um, discussed the health data space last week with them, actually, and they t told us, yeah, there are risks, but just communicate them, be transparent on it. And I think that's, that's what we need to learn with all these black boxes and digital health and AI, where we something goes in and some, something goes out and we don't know exactly what's going in there. So just be transparent on all the risks and the benefits as well. So, yeah. Right. You need to identify them first and then you need to be transparent about them. Annabelle, now we come to you. Yes. I actually have a question for Ren because we have a similar situation evolving in the European Union with um, the problem that notified bodies which do the conformity assessment for medical devices, including AI in the future because our AI Act don't ask, but it's with cross-references, etc. So the notified bodies in the end should assess AI, which makes it very difficult. Huh? They are not trained. We, there are already bottlenecks. This is well known. How do you deal with this? I mean, how do you train uh, authorities in Israel? How do you, how do you approach this? Um, the way we do it right now is put a lot of emphasis on the uh, actual uh, payer provider uh, organizations to self-regulate and, and assess within these organizations some of the things that they're trying to put in place, uh, whether it is internally developed or it is bought from the outside. For instance, at Clalit, and, and already getting into something that we wanted to discuss later, but get, uh, uh, talking uh, about Clalit, we have a set of uh, multidisciplinary teams that assess every new innovation and every new technology that comes in. And in the last year, what we've been doing is training them to be able to assess and creating a uh, systematic uh, approach uh, and checklists and recommendations and guidance on how within the organization, within Clalit, you have to remember Clalit is not the usual organization, it's half of the Israeli healthcare system integrated into one, uh, which is uh, qu quite unique. Uh, so we need to be self-sufficient about this because when we try to introduce, it's very difficult to get central guidance on this because of all the reasons that I've mentioned. So we've been guiding our uh, those committees that assess every new technology come in to be able to do this uh, um, setting specific assessment and uh, to make sense whether there's this is safe and appropriate. I see that you have a continuing, please. 
the data quality problem. How do you tackle this? Because you to to get this to have this all functioning, also data quality is of key importance. Do, do they also assess that, or who does that? Absolutely. Again, we're fortunate. Our data quality is is quite good uh, throughout. Uh, everything is digital and, and everything is integrated and we have a single EMR system in all of our hospitals and a single EMR system in all of our community setting and they are completely interoperable with a central health information exchange. So that makes things slightly easier to assess in terms of the available. The, the usual the problem is, was the data used to develop this appropriate and can we trust this new AI gizmo coming in? And that's where the approach I've mentioned come in. And in many cases, what we do is we say, let's do a local assessment. Let's introduce this in a limited, time limited, uh, or a setting limited uh, event. Uh, have this technology be introduced, have this AI be introduced, do a continuous assessment of whether or not it achieves what it's supposed to achieve, uh, its goals, uh, its um, um, perceived quality of, of outcomes, and whether we're happy uh, with that. And if it is, then it is then widely disseminated and put into a different set of continuous assessment mechanism. And if it is not, then we stop this uh, you know, pilot or, or small setting uh, environment and, and move on to the next thing. So this is one approach you could take in this uh, very, very um, mystified environment that we live in right now. Can I, can I make an analogy and correct me if this is not in the right direction? If we take Clalit as sort of like an equivalent to an integrated health system for an entire country, doing what you just described would be sort of relying on real world evidence, just introducing something, more focusing on what is going on after that, and then in a limited time frame, if you see that something's going wrong, you stop it, or it doesn't deliver, you stop it. Is that enough for That's patient safety? No, this is just part of the, the, the okay. question. Before this kicks in, there's a whole assessment process of the appropriateness of the whole process that has brought us to this point in which this new, device, new uh, uh, system uh, has been created. We need to get specific data information from the manufacturer, from the developers, uh, and these are assessed by our teams to see whether this seems to be appropriate. We know how a responsible AI system should be developed and what are the stages and what are the uh, pre-deployment assessments that should have been done by those manufacturers, by those developments. And we actively assess whether those steps have been properly taken, at least by declaration of the uh, developer manufacturer. Then we assess face validity of, of this through uh, w the data they bring in in order to uh, uh, persuade us to, to put this in place. And only then do we approve it uh, for uh, uh, preliminary assessment. And then there's ongoing assessment that we've talked about. But this is not like, you know what, let's just put it in, see what happens, and if there's a problem, we'll stop. That We wouldn't do it in pharmaceuticals, you wouldn't do it in medical device, you probably shouldn't do it in AI as well. Correct. This is what, what I'm getting at, that we really need to think about these levels of governance of, and then it depend, depending on the structure of the system, it's either a regulatory mechanism or some sort of other uh, pathway. Yanis, I see you with the microphone, are you already gearing up? Because yeah. this, is, this is fascinating and obviously it resonates a lot. So just to go, to go back to the basics. So number one, develop norms and guidelines so that we understand what we're talking about and what we need. Secondly, um, evaluate, assess, because not everything that shines is gold, and I think the Ron made it clear. Uh, thirdly, use horizon scanning so that we know how to navigate our way and we know what is worth it, what is not worth it, um, uh, inform our investment um, uh, choices, and then the fourth element, uh, which also comes from this uh, discussion that we just had, um, boost our capacity, our own capacity. Why? Because there needs to be um, a sharing of knowledge. Uh, uh, it's, it's clear also listening to what we just uh, uh, said. Um, make sure that, uh, because you know, I just want to bring a bit of a reality check of what we see across uh, our members. Uh, I mean, there are uh, differences and uh, different levels of uh, progress or different levels of implementation between countries, EU member states, but also within countries. And therefore, uh, I think the message that we also have from, from our members, social security institutions, is that we really need to strengthen also the exchange of best practices. We need to educate each other. We need to learn from each other and to share um, these questions and dilemmas also.
So the, the fourth pillar or the fourth uh, key element, I would say, would be also to boost the capacity and the digital literacy uh, because, you know, uh, here I think we are, we are talking about a lot of things that, um, at least from uh, our experts, uh, we're still trying to find the answers and obviously also on the, on the legislative uh, level and how to regulate these things. And I think we will see um, these initiatives like uh, what Annabel referred to, the AI Act, uh, and in general how we deal with AI in Europe, even more also in the next mandate of the, over the next uh, five years of the European legislature. Yeah. Thank you. And like, can I spoil your turn, which is coming, and add the fifth pillar of patient involvement, right? Yeah. So I'm just preempting you so that you don't have to speak. That's fine. Now we'll come, we'll come to you in a second. Annabel, over to you. No, you had your head up, she didn't. I just, I just I, I anticipated the point. Go ahead. Just to build on what Janis said, with we need norms and guidelines. Again, and legislative response, and I do agree to that. However, I think we need to really have a concept. And my criticism here is that I think in the European Union we are lacking having a clear idea what we want to do with digital health and innovation. I criticize that we, have, we lack a real a holistic concept of how we want to deal with this. Um, just to give you a practical example, because you, re you said reality check. So if we have an, an AI act, and that leads my members to get active in standardization, not only European standardization, but also international standardization, because they have to comply with these standards. However, we have a whole range of standards already set in place globally for medical devices, also for software as a medical device. So we are duplicating, we're producing a lot of new layers, which probably are even necessary. However, it causes a lot of costs because we have to comply with all of this. Again, simply because we're having conflicting legal regimes requiring another set of new things to do. And my, my point is here, we need to think about a concept maybe for AI, for instance, I was thinking, do we really need for any new technology a new law? D did we have a law for internet? Did we have a law, do we need a new law when we have another groundbreaking technology in 10 years' time? That's my point. I think conceptually we need to rethink a little how we deal with this. Thank you. And now, Anna? Thank you. Um, I think that the things about patient involvement and patient engagement is that they need time. So. It's, it's a fifth pillar, but we can't think about it like the fifth pillar that's on top, but it's a fifth pillar that, that's there, and you have to, to think about it right from the start, right from when you develop something, and then you have to be that flexible that you can change it. Because, I mean, you have very good ideas, and you bring them to the table, and you have thought about it like a lot, because otherwise you wouldn't bring it to the table, right? And then the patients say, no, we don't need that. Start again, and that's painful. <laughs> And we've all been there, but it's important because in the end, and for it to be safe and to improve patient safety as well, this needs to be a, a, a crucial step and you have to yeah, give it time and also the resources because they're here, they, they share their experience, they are the experts, so they should be remunerated for that. And I think those are the important things to, to see them not as a cherry on top, but as a fifth pillar that's grounded. Thank you. Uh, this brings me to uh, the point of accountability. And Rand, there is a question in the Q&A uh, for you. How accountability is regulated or approached um, in Israel when it comes to data? Because you, you told us that you've had the structures in place for a long time. What are they? So how do you actually get to that place where the culture is in a situation where it's OK, everything data is shared, it can be used that way, patients are not objecting your all good. I, again, I think uh, that we're fortunate because uh, first and foremost, the general approach to privacy is very different in Israel than in some of the countries we're talking about here. Uh, the example I always give, <clears throat> when we go to the supermarket and the cashier uh, comes to us after we uh, have the check and they say, um, um, would you like to get your um, member club discount? And you say yes. He says, okay, tell me your ID. 
and you go ahead and you say your ID so everybody can hear and she cl clicks it in and then you get your whatever it is. I can't think of another country uh, in Western Europe when someone would say their social security number or their uh, uh, to the cashier in front of everyone else. That, that's not very highly likely to happen. So this just a, a point to prove that uh, we uh, have a different mindset to begin with. The second point is that we've had 15 years to prove to our um, public that we use their data, A, judiciously, B, for their own benefit in a measurable, meaningful way. This is not something we do for bureaucrats. This is not something we do to collect data in order to collect data. This is bringing back. They get back from this. They get real, clear benefits. And they're why they support. Not only do they support, the four HMOs that are competing between themselves, this is a key thing of competition. They, we had huge billboard signs this year. Clalit AI in order to drive better uh, um, uh, you know, uh, people choosing us because people understand that the use of AI and the use of data is going to drive towards higher quality, better care, and they want to see us compete on who's bringing the biggest, most important innovation in for their benefit. So I think, again, when you are able to show that this has an impact, and it takes time to show the impact, because you begin by asking for physicians to work extra time in order to key in all the data, and for patients to, to do a leap of faith and, and allow you to use this data. So you need to show that you're using it for the proper uh, meaningful processes, that you have a meaningful impact on the quadruple aim, that you're able to improve population health, to improve the level of service and access, to improve the efficiency of the use of scarce resources, and to improve the joy of work for the providers. And only then they will continue to trust you with an increase not only in allowing you to use their data, but in actually urging you, and this is the case in Israel now, they are urging us yeah. to use data more, to collaborate more, to innovate more in order to drive care quality and uh, population health. Thank you. I'll combine two of the things that are coming into the, to the slide of questions. There's one question that asks whether we're focusing on the wrong thing and what we actually should be trying to achieve would be to get more time for health workers to talk to patients. This is one thing. Um, and the other thing is how can we realistically regulate AI when we can't regulate in a consistent way other things like health data protection and things like that. So I combine that to, to ask, and this is not just to you, Ran, it's just because you just mentioned it. Can we, how can we realistically regulate AI so that we give health workers the time to talk to patients? Perhaps this is the, this is the way to look at it, because this is what you said, right? Increase the joy of work, increase or decrease the unnecessary burden of things that you don't need to be doing, so that you get the time back to do the things that you actually should be doing yourself and not leaving to technology. Right? So how do we then get to that point? And then my, my next round of questions the questions for you all is, what are you currently doing, not wishing for, but actually currently doing in your institutions to try to figure out um, this balance? It's a hard question, right? but what is it? How are you advancing, in a way, what we know, what we need for digital health governance, uh, perhaps to get to that point, where we get the technologies that we need to actually improve care in all these dimensions, not only add quality or add effectiveness, but also give back um, to the health workforce, who is now currently under so much pressure, um, the possibility to talk to their patients. And this is also what the, the patients would wish for. So in a sense, how do we, this is the core question for the entire session, how do we harness the right types of innovation? This is why we need governance frameworks in a way. Rand, do you want to start? Sure. sure, okay. I think anything that you want to improve, you have to measure. Mm -hmm. So the first step in order to be able to make smart inferences on this topic is to be able to assess continuously. So if you want to put a new technology in, you have to assess the different axes in which it will have an impact on your system and to assess the impact on all of them. Sometimes these go in different directions, okay? You ha you're putting in a new technology, it increases costs, but what is it offset by? Is it offset by any a measurable improvement in meaningful quality? Is it offset by a meaningful improvement in access and waiting times? Is it offset by a, uh, as you said, increased joy of work in the sense that we reduce some of the clerical unnecessary work that we are now burdening our physicians and nurses and allied health professionals with unnecessarily? We make them, they, they've studied for so many years and then we make them clerks 
data entry clerks, uh, administrative approval clerks, that is not sparking joy. Um, and they are becoming more and more vocal about it and for a good reason. It becomes almost um, inappropriate in the way that we make them uh, do their daily job. And I think one of the key potentials for making a meaningful difference in this comes from technology and AI. If you do this right, it reduces burden. If you do this wrong, it increases burden. Every new technology could be potentially another clerical requisite for the physician or for the patient. Why won't you fill these 15 questions that were just sent to you by SMS before we will talk to you? That, again, on the patient side, does not necessarily make them much happier about the opportunity to participate in the digital health game. So one thing is to measure, to ask, to see, to measure continuously what is the impact on all of these accesses in everyone. And the second, have a feedback loop. So have an ability to get feedback from the users, whether it's the providers or the patients, whomever this innovation is aimed at, and use this feedback to continuously improve. You don't improve, you lose trust, then you will not be able to introduce the next one. The final point that I'll men uh, mention in this is the issue of incurred costs. And I will say this, without a proper IT infrastructure, every new innovation becomes involved with a lot of manual work and a lot of incurred cost in every case again and again. A sound, um, standardized data infrastructure makes the introduction of new innovation easier and less costly and more likely to balance a cost-benefit uh, ratio that would make sense for a health system. So you need to invest initially with a sound IT infrastructure that makes the introduction of innovation a little bit more sensible in terms of time and effort and cost before you can begin reap the benefits. And otherwise, again, every attempt would be involved with so much friction and so much pain that it makes it uh, almost inappropriate. And in, virtual re in, in actual reality, it doesn't happen. Thank you. So standardization, you mentioned it, also a governance issue. So it is within the first pillar, I think, that you mentioned, Yanis, earlier. I think you might want to come in on this? Yeah. Just what are, what are we doing, uh, the, yeah. the, your question. First of all, we are investing uh, big amounts of money in developing these solutions and in designing these um, interventions. Secondly, I think internally uh, we invest a lot of time and energy also in training our own experts and in um, enabling this collaboration amongst uh, between different social security institutions across Europe so as to learn from each other, that's, that's clear. Uh, because it's not about uh, only digital literacy for the others, but also for us. Um, and the third element that brings me to the, the fact that in designing these um, solutions or the IT infrastructure that you referred to, um, and obviously there, there are a lot of things already existing and in place, and there, there are questions also as to how um, compatible uh, the, the systems or the, um, uh, for instance, the European health data space, uh, how compatible that has to be and how consistent that has to be uh, with national, with existing national infrastructure. That is a key um, uh, dimension for us. Um, and the, the other element that we do is that we have this um, uh, constant evaluation and, and how do we do that and there are examples from uh, our uh, members in different countries obviously we talk to the physicians we have an open channel of communication in order to also for them to be beneficial and to invest their time and energy and to not to affect or to disrupt the patient journey uh, in any way and also for us to be able to get the information we need or to be able to um, integrate this data into the, our systems and uh, decision-making procedures also for reimbursement uh, and others. So this is what we're doing. Excellent. Do you, when you collaborate among your uh, members, yes. uh, collaborative platforms with the developers? Um, yes, it varies from, absolutely, it varies from uh, country to country, but yes, indeed. Because yeah. I was going to come to you, Annabelle, and ask about the value of this. Yeah. Yeah, well, as I mentioned before already, uh, in Belgium, for instance, we do collaborate. Um, there is a platform hosted by our member Agoria, which is in consultation with you, where new innovations are fed in. So just to, because you asked what, what, are me, um, what are we doing in our organization, and you mentioned, Ren, um, the point of measure and infrastructure. Yes, so we do help in measuring, at least for the countries we're involved in. 
actively in six countries at the moment. This is to be read in the report um, to see um, whether it's fit for reimbursement. And as I said, it's usually interim reimbursement models, which are then reassessed after a certain period of time. And we do support in this respect um, the competent authorities or insurance, uh, whoever is responsible for this. Um, secondly, you mentioned infrastructure, <clears throat> and indeed, and Janis, you uh, refer to the European health data space, and indeed here we have to contribute a lot to make this work in, in two, um, from two perspectives. For the primary use, of health care, primary use of health data, and we haven't discussed this yet, we need to be, have interoperable electronic health records. Uh, my members heavily work on this, and we facilitate this via our, our organization, of course, because indeed this is of key importance without interoperability. We can forget about health data sharing. And secondly, for the secondary use of health data, of course, we need to build up the infrastructure health data at EU. And I think all of us, at least in Brussels, are somewhat involved in building up this infrastructure. And that's what we also do at COSIA and contribute to the discussions. Thank you very much. Anna, over to you. Thank you. Uh, at the LVI, we, we do have this open innovation science um, principles, and this is very much involved in all of our program lines and, and a lot of projects, not only with patients, but also with healthcare professionals, because all these um, digital tools do have to work for both sides, or at least for both sides. So they are involved and they are th thought of like from the start, and when the idea pops up, we discuss it as a team, and we always have the, the um, possibility to object to something or to ask questions, because it's not just like it's bad, but why do you do that? And if you think about it, and if you have to formulate it, and if you have to like, yeah, talk about it, it gets even harder. And then you have to be concise, and then you have to be clear, and then questions pop up as well, and it's, get, it's getting better. And that's, that's the point of it. And yeah, so OES uh, really helps. Okay. Thank you very much for that. I think we, yes, Ran, briefly. Just one thing. Um, it's easy to be paralyzed by all of these yeah. challenges. And I strongly urge uh, everybody who's involved in this process to make everything that they can not to paralyze the various systems in the different member states, in the different organizations. Allow room for safe experimentation. And uh, uh, before you begin using this technology, you are not able to properly regulate or understand some of the difficulties and some of the re benefits. So whatever it is we do, we need to strike a proper balance. We can't be reckless, but we can't make this so constructive and because we don't fully understand this, just let's not do. That's the easiest mm -hmm. and that's most detrimental because at this point, let's remember, innovation and digitization is a, member, is a matter of sustainability. Without the ability to move quickly forwards, our systems will falter. And there's a price to pay for not taking a chance right now. It is not about the thing that says, you know, that, that's a very bold idea, let's, let's defer it. If we defer it, there's a price to pay. There's a price to pay in, this, in the uh, um, provider burnout. There's a price to pay in the waiting times. There's a price to pay in terms of people losing their lives because the current systems are no longer able to provide the care in the way that they did. So if we don't offer an alternative, the status quo has a very dear price we usually do, discount, do not discount, and we have to take it into account when we try to assess risk versus benefit of innovation, digitization, and some courageous leaps forward. Thank you. I think you also sort of gave me your closing statement inadvertently because we're going towards the end of the slot today. I, I bring in something that was said in the, in the slide, and it fits, I think, well with what, with what you're saying. It says, in order to make good use of AI, we need to understand and we need to have a clear vision about what we want it for. So I think this is probably where the two things combine. We really need to have a clear understanding and that reflect that is reflected in the governance frameworks as well of what it is that we want it for and then what the spaces are that we are willing to provide in order to have that be developed in a in an auspicious way and in a way that forwards health system goals. I will give you all 30 seconds or 40 seconds to for a closing reflection, and I apologize to the people in the room that we didn't really manage uh, to take questions live. We had a lot of them uh, online or on the Slido. Hopefully some were coming from you, then I don't feel so bad. Um, about how we can work together. You've all talked about this already, uh, but if you had one thing that you would single out, that you would like to see in this area of thinking about digital governance moving forward, particularly in the European setting, and Ran, you can reflect on what we can learn from you, summarize, uh, what would that be? 
I don't need 30 seconds, I guess. Put patience on the table. Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Loud and clear. Um, with the patient in focus, we need to um, make sure we can uh, guarantee the security, interoperability, and accessibility. And this is what we collaboratively need, need to work on. Thank you. Janis? I, I agree with just uh, with uh, what Annabel just said and add um, ownership and the clarity uh, of where we want to go and how um, whatever we develop fits into and meets our needs. And ownership is very important in that, ownership and clarity. Ownership, who's of what? Of whatever we develop from the different stakeholders, having the buy-in, making sure that this is a, there is a proactive consultation and not simply um, throwing something and hoping that it will work. Okay, Ran, final words. There's no single recipe for the way forward, and nobody has the right answers at this point. We need okay. to acknowledge that. That shouldn't paralyze us from being active in trying to find the right way forward. And for this, we need to collaborate more within the region, but also outside, and uh, to learn from best practices uh, wherever they are, and slowly, slowly adapt until we get it right. Thank you. That chimes with horizon scanning, work together, learn from best practices, develop the, the governance frameworks of the future, which we will present to you next year when we meet again here in Gastein. Thank you all very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of the conference. And thank you to our panel, of course.